Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. And another heavyweight news mashup video today, starting with Derek Chisora and David Hay parting company. So Hay no longer going to be managing Chisora. And I have to say, I actually did see Chisora's post first. And it was a bit ambiguous to me because it sounded more like a love letter than a parting ways type thing because it wasn't explicitly stated. But um, they have parted company because that part was definitely in David Hay's sta statement. We will start first. He says, it's been an action packed couple of years getting Derek Walsh Ch uh, Chisora back in the mix of the heavyweight division, taking him from Del Boy to war mode. When we announced our unlikely partnership, we pledged to give fight fans the big nights of heavyweight clashes they had called out for and that I believe we have achieved. Whilst I will no longer be managing Derek, I naturally continue to follow and support his career with great interest. The UK remains at the epicentre of the heavyweight division and Derek stands to, ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them all. 2021 is looking very exciting for him with a number of options available. Maybe a little rose tinted on to, uh, in terms of uh, Chisora's prospects going forward, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Chisora, him saying, uh, everyone close to me thought I was crazy when I told them I wanted David Hay to manage me. But in the last two and a half years, my performances in the ring have spoken for themselves giving fight fans the battles they wanted to see even when COVID put a handbrake on everything. I may have been robbed against both Usyk, that's debatable, and Parker, but they have uh, but have developed as a fighter. 2021 is looking very interesting. I'm back in camp, ready to go this autumn. It's time for war. I would like to thank David for his support at times, patience and guidance during our time working together. Hashtag War Chisora. So there's a couple of things with all of this that I wanted to sort of pick up in terms of analysis, because I guess the question, you know, everyone, on everyone's lips will be, well, why now? And it wasn't really apparent. And I have to go back to that from Derek Chisora's uh, post that he was parting with Hay, but Hay obviously confirmed it. But, you know, I think a couple of things to note first, it has been a good relationship. Hay was a good foil to Chisora. Hay was able to be a good hype man, provide him opportunities, negotiate him good deals, and get him into, you know, given his record, the number of losses, all that sort of stuff, still get him into good, meaningful fights and get him really good paydays. And who would have thought a guy that was, you know, nine or ten losses on the ledger could still get on pay-per-view in this day and age? So they have actually worked well together, had a good relationship and made money all round. And that sort of leads me to the reason or my thinking on this, because, you know, through the day, I was like, well, what's really behind this? And I think Derek Chisora probably is just going to be one of the casualties of this deal of going away from Sky and moving full time the matchroom stable to DAZN. And what I mean by that, and some people might sort of say, well, casualty, um, I think that the opportunity through the pay-per-view model on Sky Sports facing, you know, good contender level fights offers him more upside, more money overall in a fight than the sort of purses he can probably get on the zone. And he probably doesn't need that sort of full wraparound service, including helping whip him into great condition. It just was a really good fit for that other model that they're in. And I think maybe the flat fee situation, you know, you take Hayes percentage out of the situation, Chisora's going to take more of it. So I think plain and simple, it probably just is about money. On sort of balance and thinking about it, I think it does make sense for Chisora, who's in the sort of twilight of his career, and he has been. I mean, they were sort of in these different posts, really talking it up and going on about the big nights to come and other bits and pieces. But he is on the tail end of it. And I do not believe that he beat Alexander Usyk. I don't think he was robbed there. He's got a much better case for the, the Joseph Parker fight because I think he banked a lot of rounds early on and obviously got the knockdown too. So they've had a good working relationship. And I think David Hay managed to con a lot of heavyweight fans into thinking that Derek Chisora was a top 10 fighter. 
he's been a guy that I've been saying for a long time now is a very good gatekeeper. He's almost at the world level, but if you can beat him, you can go on and have some big fights. If not, you're probably not good enough to mix it at world level. It just kind of is that simple. And I've had him sort of around, you know, just inside the top 20 there or thereabouts. And I don't think that's unfair. I know some people have been banging on in different uh, videos in the past sort of saying it's unfair to him, but he doesn't have the resume to actually justify it. Having good competitive solid fights against guys but still losing doesn't mean you're a top 10 fighter. It means you're probably still a very good fighter, which Chisora is, and we know he is. He's got you know some decent wins in his career. But when the best win of your career is Carlos to calm, you know, you have to kind of go, where is your place in the division? So he's still a guy that I think is there or thereabouts around top 20 and will have a good place to test up and coming guys. And there'll be no shortage of guys at different points in the next couple of years that are going to need a really good test. Uh, or maybe it's uh, coming up from cruiserweight or, you know, say like a Lawrence Acoli, something like that. I can maybe see that down, down the line too. But, you know, for Chisora, he will have to be root well remunerated for it anyway we'll move on um, Charles Martin continuing his attack on Dillian White so Martin in the past week or so really going in on White calling him out all manner of trash talk talking it up again saying he already having flashbacks uh, Dillian White you know I ain't no joke I'd smoke Pavetkin he would never did me like that and obviously the um, the image of um, Dillian White knocked out on the canvas there. Uh, Dillian White uh, has responded though. See kids, this is why you shouldn't take drugs. Just look at this crackhead here. Stay away from the crack. This guy will do anything for crack. Hashtag crackhead. Hashtag do anything for crack. And uh, Dillian White has also signaled that his next fight is almost upon us. Soon to be announced by the look of it saying soon time to destroy. And judging by comments in the past uh, sort of week or so, it seemingly is going to be Jermaine Franklin rather than um, uh, Charles Martin, who actually you can see in the comments, I knew you would prolong your ass whooping, you scrub, learn how to fight, now lift weights, bum. Moving on, so uh, you have um, Eddie Hearn actually talking to Design Boxing Show, and he was saying, if Tyson Fury wants to have a fight in between, let's do the right thing and give the fight to the mandatory challenger, which is Dillian White. So actually, I'll just clear one thing up. So Dillian White is the WBC interim champion. He is not the mandatory. It's very, you know, two different things. There is a distinction there. He is not the mandatory challenger. He's not rated in the top 15. He's the WBC interim champion. And Mauricio Suleiman has actually even confirmed that to uh, to Boxing Social. So here's another tweet. Um, he holds the interim belt, but Suleiman reiterated there is no current mandatory. But going back to that, so that all relates to Tyson Fury saying that after Deontay Wilder, if he beats him, that um, he could actually have another fight this year. And that may not be Anthony Joshua under Sputin. There's been a few sort of, you know, handbags at dawn sort of, you know, statements and quotes and sort of back and forth and bodybuilder this, muscles that, all that, all the normal sort of stuff that Tyson Fury talks about. So I think a lot of what they're looking to do with Dillian White in the meantime, say if they take that Jermaine Franklin fight as it's a lower risk fight and then see what happens with uh, Fury Wilder and maybe potentially they will look to try to get a fight. But I think in reality, Tyson Fury, he'll do what Tyson Fury wants to do. I think this is his last fight at the moment with top rank. So I can stand to be corrected on that if that's incorrect. But I think it is the, um, the last one on the deal. So Tyson Fury will be looking for a big fight next, a big money. Whoever's going to pay it, he'll go where the money is in the end. Uh, moving on to um, a couple of uh, fighters who were returning this weekend. So you've got um, the Kazakh prospect, and I tweeted about this. There's a couple of tweets that I've um, just earlier in the day put up, and I'm just going to whip through now. So Ivan Deichko, so you can see here on screen. Um, so this is um, some pad work from a little while ago, but 9-0. and So he's a former two-time Olympic bronze medalist, 2012-2016. Just really had a nothing, non-event type career so far. But he is returning after two years of inactivity in Miami. He'll be facing uh, Dennis Baktov, you know, sort of well-trodden journeyman, record of 39-18. and 18. 
not a great fight but he needs a fight any fight at this point any activity is better than nothing uh, the Nigerian prospect, Rafael Akpajuri, he's back this weekend in Miami facing Jason Bergman. Uh, Carlos Negron, you can see here, um, see here from my tweet, he's also on the same undercard. So Rafael Akpajuri, he is sort of at that point where he's been getting an increasing amount of buzz. You may have yourself been seeing a few different posts about him, a few different people talking about him, different performances, uh, maybe in the past couple of fights that are just, you know, bubbling to the surface, a little bit of buzz. It's getting to that point where, you know, I'll be paying the exorbitant sort of pay-per-view price to actually watch it because he's um, starting to generate that sort of interest where people are like, this guy actually is doing okay. We, you know, I like what I see with him. So I'll be looking to, um, if I can, you know, get a stream, pay for it, you know, however I can sort of watch it, I'll be looking to cover that fight this weekend. There's actually not a lot of big time fights on. Some of these fights that I'm um, sort of covering now, I may actually end up uh, just sort of wrapping up into one video or, you know, one or two videos. Uh, you also have uh, Peter Kaderu, so centered here. Um, he's back July 17, so he's um, versus TBA, the dreaded TBA at this point. So he's a good prospect, good skills, good technical boxer. I don't know if the promotion of him in terms of the outside of Germany has been that great, but here's a former youth world champion. He does have legitimate skills, maybe not legit power, but he's going to be one of these guys when he sort of gets to a certain level, he will be hard to beat because he's going to be able to outbox a lot of guys. He's got good size, good jab. Uh, moving on here, you also have uh, Mihai Nistor. So this is at relatively short notice. So the former amateur standout, he also owns a win over Anthony Joshua from the amateurs. He's with Golden Boy. He's going to be on a Golden Boy card this weekend that's um, headlined by Zero Ramirez. Uh, he'll be facing Colby Madison. So he put a post on Instagram about it, all that sort of stuff. Um, one of the few Golden Boy heavyweights actually fighting at the moment so previously um aslan beck makmadov had been on a co-promotional deal was never utilized apparently it's not in place anymore and they also on their books have james wilson who hasn't been cited in you know quite a long time as well so good to see nistor actually seeing the light of day getting his third uh, third pro fight first fight for 18 months don't know what he's been doing to earn a crust in that time anyway what do you make of it all Drop a comment loud and often, hit like, hit subscribe, follow me on Twitter, boxing underscore squared. I'm out.